Hi, and welcome to Teaching Nonviolent Atonement. My name is Adam Erickson. I'm Suzanne Ross. Good to see you, Adam. Hey, it's it's good to see you, Suzanne. I am here in Eugene. As you know, I just moved. You are still there in Chicago, and something very depressing happened last night in Chicago. Well, yeah, for Blackhawks fans, it wasn't a good night. Um, they yeah. lost. They lost in this whatever this round was of the playoffs in the seventh game in an overtime by you know one goal and. But what was interesting to me, Adam, was I thought that we could talk about um, atonement as being drawn into new patterns of desire by looking at this Blackhawks game and this whole series with the Kings. Because when we talk about... What does atonement have to do with a hockey game? Why not? Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that's one of the um, things that we're trying to accomplish here on our site is to reimagine what atonement means as being drawn into new patterns of desire, into healthy patterns of desire in which the fullness of our unique individuality can be expressed. And that contrasts with the patterns of desire that we see in a sports rivalry. Are you following me? I have a feeling that you are going to ruin my passion for sports. I'm, I'm going to try not to. I'm just going to um, open up your enjoyment of sports to a whole new level of understanding. But right, I, think you're, I think you're going to agree with me here because okay. when, when you look at the um, competition in the, this hockey match, um, it goes on all year, of course. And winners and losers are determined through the whole course of the year, and everybody is striving to get the same thing. They all want this thing called a Stanley Cup. It's apparently a big deal. So the Hawks and the Kings last night were competing for this chance to compete for the Stanley Cup. And what struck me was my husband, Keith, loves to watch sports as you know, Adam, you and he talk about it a lot. Um, and he was explaining the whole series to me. And at, the more he talked about it, the more I realized that these two teams were almost identical in their level of skill and athleticism and accomplishment. And the only thing that ended up separating them just came down to this one score, one goal at the end of a seven-game series that was actually in an overtime. I mean, it was so hard to figure out which team was better. And the difference between them is, is minuscule, right? And, and yet that, it means everything. Yep. It, it certainly means everything to the losers. <laughs> yeah, it means, it means one city gets to celebrate and the other city gets to mourn. It means one team moves on to the next stage of the finals, and the other team gets to go home and play golf, hang out with their family and stuff, right? Well, and so this is what I would call a, a rivalrous pattern of desire that leads to a false difference. So there's this tiny difference between them that gets blown out of proportion, and be, it, at, that everyone reacts as if that makes all the difference in the world, when in actuality, these two teams are virtually identical. Right? And yet so, you, want define, you want to define yourself over and against the other team, which means that you want to say, each city wants to say that we are, we are the good guys and they are the bad guys. And so while they are virtually, as you say, exactly the same, you have to make it as if they are complete differences in order to know that our team is the good team and their team is the bad team. Right. So we have a false difference. We have a false difference that's actually concealing ident that they're identical, right? Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, what is Jesus doing for us in the atonement 
in what we talk about as atonement, right? So what Jesus is doing is drawing us in to a new pattern of desire in which we are not in rivalry with our model and our authentic differences can emerge. Yeah? Authentic differences. Yeah. Authentic differences. You know, it, it reminds me of where Paul talks about that in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, male and female, free or slave. And it's as if he's doing away with those differences. But what I think he's doing is leading to what you are talking about, uh, authentic differences. And the way that he's doing that, I mean, clearly there are still male and female. Um, but what he's doing is saying that these differences are no longer in Christ, in this new pattern of desire. These differences are no longer to be used as excuses for scapegoating, as excuses for being in rivalry with the other. Because when you are in Christ, in this new pattern of desire, you are to be guided by the same thing, which is not rivalry with your neighbor, but love for your neighbor, including those you call your enemy. Now, the interesting thing here is how do you take that into something like that new pattern of desire, into something like the sports world? Yeah, I don't know. Um I, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that, you know, Paul also says that there are many gifts of the Spirit. And then he names this wide diversity of gifts that will be manifested when we are in non-rivalrous patterns of desire. It's not that we will all become the same, but that true and authentic and meaningful differences will emerge in which we can become supportive of one another in the body of Christ. I mean, that's what that imagery of Paul's is so beautiful, is that the body is made up of many parts that are all working together. And I think um, sometimes sports teams try to do that with, within the, their team, right? The players all try and become a cohesive unit in which they're all working together towards one goal. The problem is that rivalry that gets set up between the teams um, becomes, um, I think, very um, counterproductive uh, to an expression of real difference. So, yeah. you know, as I said, there's no real difference between the Hawks and the Kings at this point. Virtually the same. And not, not only that, it's also toxic because it pits whole cities in rivalry with one another. And so, not I mean, Chicago and L.A. are already in a rivalry with each other, and the sports only exacerbates it. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess, I don't know, what, what theologically, in addition to what we've already said, um, in Christ we see that God is for us, even when we were against God. And so how do we as Christian disciples be for those who are against us in the sports world, in the political world, in business, and all of that. It certainly takes creativity and an originality to get out of the rivalry business and into the love, forgiveness, compassion business with even your enemies. Yes. Well, I think that's why the, the practice of worship within a community, of prayer, of reading scripture, it's all about um, being drawn into this new pattern of desire in which uh, God is the source of our worth and our identity. We don't need to win trophies. We're already loved. <laughs> there you go. And that was awesome. You are loved, Suzanne. You too, Adam. All right. Well, um, that was a fun discussion on sports, and I uh, will talk to you later, okay? Sounds good.